Let's pray together, shall we? Dear Lord, as we turn now to your word, we thank you that we're not just on our own, but the Holy Spirit is there to speak to us, to guide us, to apply the truths of your word to our very own situations. And so we ask for the Holy Spirit to move amongst us, to touch us, to speak to us now through your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if you've ever been uh, lost or felt you were lost in uh, one of the beautiful national parks here in New Zealand that you're on a bush walk. Just imagine that you are lost. You have no idea how to get back to where your car is parked and the sun is setting and it's soon going to be dark. How do you feel about that? Uh, and uh, maybe you get very nervous. But then all of a sudden you see up ahead a signpost and it points you in the right direction. And very often in the national parks in New Zealand you'll even, it'll even tell you how far to go. And uh, so that really makes you excited. That signpost gives you hope. It points you in the right direction. And then as you're going, you come round one final corner and there you see ahead of you the car park and your car and you know you'll be okay. You've reached your destination, at least. You've found your way back. And that's a great feeling, isn't it? Um, and this was the kind of feeling that C.S. Lewis had when he found God. He was a famous professor uh, at Oxford University and also Cambridge University and he wrote this book Surprised by Joy which is about how he found faith. He was an atheist but there were a number of things in his life pointing him, pointing him forward and finally he discovered that true joy, he was searching for joy. The destination, his destination was to find what's the purpose of life? What is, where is joy? Where is true joy? And he found that it was in God. It was in knowing God. Now he never imagined that there was any connection between joy and God. In fact, he thought the opposite. He thought that surely anything to do with God was very boring and very scary and very um, just keeping him all abound and no, no freedom. But he found that true joy was in a person. It was not in success. It was not in a place. It was not in things. It was in God. And this was a wonderful discovery that C.S. Lewis found. And so we come to our first point today, and that is joy is found in Jesus. He is the focus. He is the source, the fountain of joy. And, and Jesus prays in John 17, verse 13, uh, that for those of you who uh, didn't know we're looking at a series of talks on John 17 and in verse 13 Jesus prays this to his father he says I'm coming to you now but I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them Jesus speaks of my joy within them my joy he doesn't ask that his followers will be all happy no problems in worldly terms, but he prays that they will find joy in him. Find him, because in him there is joy. Worldly joy is not the same as true joy. Because worldly joy depends on whether we're successful, whether we're popular, whether everything goes our own way. That's worldly joy. We feel happy because everything's going our, our way. But as we've said before, Happiness is different to joy. True joy is only found in Christ. I think of Johann Sebastian Bach, the German composer who wrote uh, this beautiful song, Jesu, Joy of Man's Desiring. It's, it's actually a cantata, a choral cantata. And uh, I'm sure that he understood this truth, that joy is found in Jesus. Because uh, the words of uh, the original German are very, very powerful. I'm going to ask if we can play that. Uh, I don't know if you, you'll, you'll recognize it, I think, when we play. And I want you to just see the words that are translated from the original German of one of the verses. Thank you. As 
we listen, just look at those words on the screen. Jesus remains my joy, my heart's comfort and essence. He is my life's strength, my eyes' desire and sun, my soul's love and joy. you'd rather listen to the rest of that than listen to the message this morning but Elizabeth she uh, chose this piece of music for our wedding and when she walked in uh, at the beginning of the wedding ceremony uh, in St Paul's in Simon Street there this was the music that she played had we were had playing as she came down the aisle and of course she wasn't thinking oh Peter uh, how wonderful that I'm going to be married to him uh, I think that she, like C.S. Lewis and Johann Sebastian Bach, she knew that true joy is found in Christ. He is the only source of true joy. It's not found in things, it's not found in any person. It's found in the Lord Jesus. But how sad that so many people confuse joy with happiness. Like we said, happiness depends on what happens. And if nice things happen, we feel good. And if things go our way, we feel good. But that's not true joy. C.S. Lewis uh, was someone who found true joy because some people make this other mistake of looking in the wrong place. He was one who thought God and joy, they can't possibly go together. And that's exactly what Satan wants us to think. Satan wants us to think if we believe in God, if we give our lives to God, we're going to be restricted, we're going to, be lo- we're going to lose our freedom, we're not going to be really happy, and yet the very opposite is true. When we give ourselves to God, we find ourselves, we find true freedom, we find true joy, true satisfaction. And Satan is the one who restricts us. He is the one who makes us miserable. He is the one who who takes us down a very uh, dangerous, rocky path. And that, that this is only in Christ that we find uh, this wonderful freedom, this deep down joy. And so King David was someone who experienced that. He was a successful, powerful king, but he knew that joy, true, da- tr- true j- deep down joy could only be found in Christ. And this is in Psalm 16. We just read the other psalm a moment ago. But Psalm 16 says, I keep my eyes always on the Lord. This is King David speaking. With him at my right hand I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad, my tongue rejoices, my body also will rest secure. You make known to me the path of life and you fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. This is uh, someone who has discovered that the real fountain of joy is God himself. He'd found the secret, not based on circumstances, because actually David had some very tough things in his life, very difficult times. But in all those difficulties, that he had learned that the joy of the Lord was, was his... Um, the, in, joy in God's presence was the thing that he needed. And for today and tomorrow, it's the same. Joy depends not on our circumstances but on the Lord and remember Jesus was praying this the night before his crucifixion and so he was not facing an easy path and yet he prayed for his disciples to know that deep down joy he said uh, just before the prayer in John 16 he said I tell you you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices you will grieve but your grief will turn to joy 
And this is the wonderful promise. You know, Jesus was going to be beaten and he was going to be nailed to the cross and yet uh, and die like a criminal. And they would weep and warn, mourn, but yet three days later, the third day, he rose from the dead. They were going to rejoice to know their Lord had conquered death and conquered the grave. And how much more wonderful when Jesus comes again and we see him face to face. Jesus went on to talk in the next verse, verse 21 of John 16, about a mother giving birth. And we know, those of you who are mothers know, it's not an easy thing to give birth to a child. My mother, my mother said she thought she was going to die when she gave birth to me. It was a terrible thing. Uh, and, uh, but I made it easier for all the others coming after me. Uh, because <laughs> she had four more kids and all the others were much easier. I don't know if those of you with more than one found the first one the most difficult. I don't know. But anyway, my mum said it was very tough. But she, surprisingly, she was very happy after I was born. And um, she, she was very pleased to have a son. And my mother, you know, her, her pain turned to joy. Great joy. And she forgot about the pain until we asked her about it. She forgot about it. And the Jesus goes on to say, So with you. Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice. And no one will take away your joy. Peter, the apostle, said a similar thing. He said uh, of us as Christians, uh, he said, though you have not seen him, this is in 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 8, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Peter knew it as well. Not circumstances, but joy in knowing the Lord even though we haven't seen him. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talked about blessed are these people and those people, different people who are blessed. And in verses 11 and 12, interestingly, he says, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. How can Christians be glad and rejoice when we face persecution? How is that possible? Clearly Jesus is talking more, uh, more, he's not just talking about things going well when everything's fine, but in persecution. It's not superficial happiness he's talking about. He's talking about a deep down joy of knowing that we are in the will of God. He's not talking about pleasant feelings or earthly prosperity. He's talking about experiencing true hope and true joy, even when things are looking very difficult. And that's only possible when we come to him, the source of our joy. So that's the first point. Joy is found in Jesus. And the second point is that joy depends upon obedience. It depends upon obedience. If we want to experience deep down joy, we need to know uh, a life of obedience. The, ni the night before Jesus was crucified, as we've been saying there in John uh, 13 through to 16, he spoke with his disciples. And in chapter 15, he says this, If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this, so that my joy may be in you. Remember he prays, let my joy be within them. My joy will be in you and your joy will be complete. When his joy is in us, our joy will be complete. And it all depends on living in obedience. We won't experience this joy uh, unless we're living a life of obedience to the Lord's will. If we're going our own way, we're not going to be very happy. We'll never be happy. It's like a, a, a child. Obedient child, an obedient child is a happy child. Uh, uh, parents are also very happy, of course, when their children are obedient. And loving and wise parents who know how to put boundaries for their kids, know how to discipline their children, when their children are obedient and live within those boundaries, the children are happy, and the parents are happy too. And so it is with us in our relationship with the Heavenly Father. 
But now why are some Christians so joyless, so miserable, like these poor kids? We're always upset with something. Some Christians go around looking a bit like those kids do. And uh, you wonder, why is it? Why are we like that sometimes? And I think one of the reasons is that like children, when, we, when we're not following the, the parents and not obedient, we're not going to be happy. And if there's disobedience in our hearts, we're not going to be happy. We're not going to enjoy the joy of the Lord in our lives because we, we're going our own way. We're wanting to not submit to God's will, but we want to go our own way. We don't want to, uh, we don't want to say sorry we want to hold on to a grudge. We, want to, we, want, we don't want to forgive. So why should I forgive? They are the ones who should be forgiving me. What do you mean? I've got to say sorry? Oh, forget it. And uh, not surprisingly, we're never going to be happy. We'll be miserable. We need to learn to say sorry to God and to one another. We need to repent and be reconciled with the Lord. And that's what David found in Psalm 51. You remember he committed... Uh, he committed adultery. He actually had a, a murder happen. He, he caused that to happen. It was a very bad situation David got into and he tried to cover it up. He tried to make out that everything's fine, nothing going on here and yet God exposed it through the prophet Nathan. And when David realized, yes, he has sinned, he knew he'd been sinning, covering up his sin, he had this amazing psalm of repentance Psalm 51. And after he repented of his sin, he confessed to God, it says there, he cried out, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Grant me a willing spirit and sustain me. You know, sin drives a wedge between us and God. That's a wedge there in that piece of wood. You put a wedge and knock the wedge and help split the wood. A wedge drives us apart from God. It breaks the relationship and it spoils our fellowship. It ruins the intimacy. Uh, and so when we confess, when we say sorry, when we come back, we can find that our joy is restored. Intimacy is restored and the joy of our salvation is restored. So I hope this is an important point for us to remember that obedience is a condition of experiencing God's joy. Now you might have a question. You say, well, hang on a minute. I can't think of anything that I've done. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not rebelling against God, but I'm still feeling miserable. What's the problem? I'm still feeling miserable. Well, one reason may be that you're looking at the circumstances, looking at the problems which are always there in life, and you forget to look to the Lord. We need to remember He is the source of our joy and not the circumstances. So that's another thing. Even if you're a Christian, not living in disobedience, but you're forgetting to look to the Lord. That could be one reason. But there may be another reason, and that is that you, you have a, a melancholic temperament, and you look on the negative side of things always. And uh, you find things, you be f easily feel discouraged and depressed. A lot of people face depression, actually. And it's part of the it's part to do, partly to do with our personality, our temperament. But the good news is, even if you've got a, a sort of melancholic temperament, you can still find joy in the Lord. Because we as Christians do not have to be defeated by our temperament. Our temperament doesn't have to control and determine the way we live. It influences us, it affects us, but we can learn to trust on the Lord's strength. And that's what the Holy Spirit does for us. The, the fruit of the Spirit helps us, the Holy Spirit helps us to overcome those weaknesses in our temperaments. Now everyone has a different personality, a different temperament. Some uh, seldom feel depressed, even in terrible situations. I think I'm a bit like that myself. My wife says I'm always smiling. Well, I haven't had a look, you know, I can't see my face. But I don't feel like the world, well, a couple of times I've felt, you know, oh, it's a bit, a bit tough, you know. But I, I enjoy life, especially when I've got my wife's cooking, you know. <laughs> but, you know, I don't feel discouraged very easily. 
some people, my, one of my brothers, he, he very easily feels down. He's like, come on. You know, we're all different, right? But someone of my personality has other problems, other weaknesses. But the wonderful thing is the Holy Spirit can make up the, the problems in our different personalities. Where we're weak, he can make us strong. He can strengthen us. So if you, if you have a natural tendency to be depressed or lacking in joy, and there's no other reason that you're not, not disobeying God, you're not sinning, doing your own thing, you really love the Lord, but you still can't find joy, well, maybe this is something to remember. Ask the Holy Spirit to strengthen you, to help you. This is what Galatians 5, 22 and 23 says. The fruit of the Spirit is love, and number two is joy. And all these wonderful things that we don't have of our own selves. How many of you uh, can be pe are peace, peaceful and patient and kind all the time and good and faithful and gentle and under self-control? These are not the fruits of our natural human nature. In fact, the opposite. These are the fruits of the Spirit. And so wonderful news for a Christian. We can draw on the strength that, of the Holy Spirit to give us that joy. Paul knew about it. Paul, in prison, could write, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say it again, rejoice. Paul wrote that in prison. Wrote to the Philippians, chapter 4, verse 4. Of course, he was thinking the Lord is near, and so that was a good reason to rejoice. But even in prison, Paul could rejoice because he'd learned the secret of a spirit-filled life. So that's the second point. Joy depends upon obedience. But thirdly and finally, joy comes through giving. Have you noticed that some of the most unhappy people, the most joyless people, are the ones who only think about themselves, the ones who think about themselves, whereas those who are very happy and joyful are the ones who are able to give themselves to others. They give time, they give practical support, they give friendship, and they're full of joy as they serve. Paul, when he was saying goodbye to the Ephesian elders uh, at the beach uh, near, Ephes near Ephesus, Miletus, he said this to them. He said, in everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And that is Acts 20, verse 35. Now you won't find that, that Jesus saying that in any of the Gospels. Because of course Jesus said and did many things that are not written in the Gospels. But here's one, uh, one thing Jesus said that is recorded in Acts. And they remembered, and of course it's wonderful truth that Jesus spoke. It's more blessed, more blessed to give than to receive. This reminds me of a little boy who... His, his dad gave him $5. His dad wanted to teach his son how to use money wisely. And so he gave him $5 and said, now son, you take this and use it uh, wisely and uh, see how you get on. And a little later, his dad came and asked his son, what did you do with the $5? And the boy said, dad, I lent the $5 to a poor man he was very hungry and I lent him the money. And his dad said, oh, son, that's not a good thing. You, you lend to a poor man who's hungry? Uh, he, you're never going to get the $5 back. You, you won't get the $5 back. And his son said, oh, no, dad, I will get it back. Because the Bible says those who give to the poor lend to the Lord. And his dad, who is a Christian, said, oh, oh, that's very good, my boy. I'm very pleased to hear you have that attitude. Uh, here's another five dollars. <laughs> and his bo the boy said, you see, dad, I told you. <laughs> I just didn't know I'd get it back so quickly. <laughs> so, you know, there is great joy when we give to the Lord and when we serve others. And in Luke 10... We read about those 72 being sent out two by two. And they came back, report to Jesus how the demons, even the demons submit to us in your name, they said to Jesus. They were so happy. They'd seen God 
do wonderful things. And Jesus said to them, do not rejoice. Oh yeah, great guys, I'm very glad you had a good time and the Lord, the Lord blessed you, the, the Spirit was with you, but do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, the demons, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And that's the most important thing uh, that we can rejoice about, that we have the Lord with us. It puts things in balance, doesn't it? That as we serve, we have great joy. But even more wonderful is to know that we are uh, born again and our names are written in heaven. And I want to give you another example that comes from the book of Nehemiah. Because in the book of Nehemiah, God, by his Spirit, did a great work in the people's lives as Ezra, the, the, the priest, uh, uh, read the Bible and the Levites were reading and explaining to the people. They were so convicted by what they heard that they were crying. A whole crowd in Jerusalem there, weeping. And then in Isaiah, uh, sorry, Nehemiah chapter 8, it says this in chapter 8, verses 9 and 10. Then Nehemiah the governor... Ezra the priest and teacher of the law uh, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all this day is holy to the Lord your God do not mourn and weep for all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law and Nehemiah goes on in verse 10 to say go and enjoy sweet drinks choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared this day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. This is a famous verse in the Bible. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And the context is that they were to go out and share the goodness of the Lord with others. And so the Lord strengthens us as we serve, as we give. It's a biblical principle. And there's one more example I want to give you before we close, and that is uh, Paul writing to the Christians in Corinth, that's down in the, in, the, in the bottom there. He was writing about the Christians in Philippi and Thessalonica up here. And uh, he says this when he writes, now the people in Thessalonica and, and in, in Philippi were mostly idol-worshipping pagans before they became Christians. And yet, look, look what Paul says about them. He writes to the Corinthians and he says, but now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Now look at this. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. That's a very powerful statement, isn't it? They were poor, they were suffering persecution, great trial, and yet, despite their poverty, their heart, they welled up in rich generosity. And what happened? They were, had overflowing joy. Overflowing joy. When we open our hearts to the Lord and to others and give of our time, of our talent, of our treasure sometimes, include maybe all three, many people are blessed and there's great joy. So, as we close, I want to ask you, do you want to experience this overflowing joy? Do you want to experience true happiness? Well, let's remember, first of all, Jesus is the source. You won't find it in the world. You won't find it in more money. You won't find it in people. You can only find it in the Lord. And then, uh, because the world will leave you empty and thirsty and lost. But are, the other question is, are you living in obedience? Because that's a condition of finding this real joy. Is there anything in your life that's holding you back? keeping you miserable because you're not uh, following in obedience to the Lord. Even your temperament doesn't have to suffer, doesn't have to control you. You can ask the Holy Spirit to fill you, to let his joy fill your heart. And remember finally that joy comes from giving. Giving to the Lord, giving to others, sharing the good news. Uh, some of the times I've had the most deep down joy in my heart has been in China, for example, and I've had the, the opportunity to share with somebody about the Lord Jesus. I could tell you many, many stories about that. Uh, just the great joy that wells up within you when you've had the chance to share the good news with somebody. And some people have never heard before. Kids, older people, officials, big shots, 
share the gospel, whoa, the joy just comes. You feel so thrilled about it. And so I encourage you, don't hold it down. Share the good things that God has done for you and in you. Let's pray together, shall we? Lord, we thank you so much for the wonderful gospel and the joy of our salvation, the joy that we have as we live in intimacy with you, knowing that we belong to you. And there's nothing coming between us and you, no sin, no rebellion, and no going our own way, but we want to be close to you, Lord, and we know that your joy will fill us when that happens. Please help us, those of us who struggle with feeling negatively about things or getting easily depressed. Help us, Lord, not to look at the circumstances, but to keep looking to you. And help us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Fill us with the Holy Spirit so that your joy may be one of those fruits seen in our lives. And Lord, help us to learn to give, to give to others, to share the good news, the good things that the Lord has done for us. And we know we'll have greater greater joy when we reach the final destination and we see you face to face. What joy that will be. What a day of rejoicing that will be when we see you, Lord Jesus, when you come or when you call. And we thank you now in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.